I tell you what, that's a, a good dose. I mean, that's like a vitamin C pill, <laughs> energy drink. God is a good God. God, you're a good father. You know, some of that, we just need to sit there and just diet on that. Lord, you're, can you say that over all your affairs right now? Over all the stuff you're going through, over all your big mountain you're facing. God, you're a good God. You're a good, good daddy. You're a good, good father, and I am loved by you. Can you look at all your stuff you're going through right now and say, man, I am loved by God. So Josh comes home yesterday from school. He stayed late. He, he, came, he stayed late to uh, catch up on some math at school, and so he brings this license plate in. It's all wrinkled up, busted off his bumper. Some kid backs into his truck and just leaves, doesn't leave a note. And I'm looking at this thing going, boy, there's a lesson in this. So I think we'll hammer out the thing. We'll have to go buy another plastic thing to bolt to the deal and have to scrub all the tire marks and where it raked all his paint. And he's contemplating how he's going to handle his affair. Do I, do I try to find him and whoop him? <laughs> you know, it's nice to have the, the burden that we have such injustice in our society, that people are so sorry that they, they run into your car and leave. But then I was thinking today, what a privilege. What a privilege. We get to pay for somebody's mistake. I mean, if we were on the other side of that fence and Jesus paid the highest price to pardon all my iniquities, to erase all my sins, all my transgressions, every time that Todd set out to do what Todd wanted to do and I trespassed against the things of God and he paid the highest price. And you got somebody wrecks our little bumper and we go, golly. You know, our, our transition thinking, our thinking has got to shift if we're going to win a culture. We have got to become living sacrifices. You know, I kept seeing Abraham going up to the altar tonight while she was worshiping. Abraham's going to the altar. We already know the story. We know he's going to have a ram caught in the thickets. But I saw many of us going up to the altar. We don't, we're not, really not sure God's going to show up. We're really not sure that God's going to come through. You know, some of y'all got some incredible words in the last month and a half. And this is your season that you have to wrestle with those words, whether they really sink in and you grab a hold to them and mix them with faith so they prosper in your life. You're going to your altar. You're going up your hill. You're going to face your battle. And the question is whether we're going to get with God and know that he's our God. He's a good, good father. He's a good, good daddy. I'm loved by him. He can't help but show up. You know, and Samson and all his childish behavior, one thing he had in his ingredient is he knew God was going to show up. Didn't matter what he touched, what he defiled, he knew on the other side of that defilement, God still was going to come through because God can't help but be faithful because God swears by his name. He honors the things that he sets. And somehow we get it all mixed up. We get back in Galatians and we get bewitched and we think, man, I, I just hadn't done enough this and this and this, so God can't show up yet. Really? And I don't think Abraham, man, he was going up there. I guarantee you he did not want to crucify his son. I guarantee you when he, when he tied him to the altar, he did not want to raise the knife to him. It was everything in him fighting against what God wanted. I mean, he didn't just go up there, oh, yeah, I'm just anxious to get up there and crucify my son. There's no way he had that in his heart. No way. So we're all going up and we're going somewhere, but we've got to find out where are we headed. And so tonight I wanted to talk about vision. How do we keep a vision? It says that, you know, if, if you, whatever you behold, that's what you become. So if you keep beholding your vision, you will apprehend the vision. It says without vision, you do what? You perish. Or one translation says you cast off restraint. And so that's what happens a lot of times is when we don't have it going our way and things aren't measured out the way we think it should be measured, we'll literally cast our restraint off and we'll give in to, you know, some people's sin may be watching soap opera. And you say, well, I'd never do that. Yeah, but that's you. Somebody else may get down in the dumps and just get into depression, and so they just sit there and watch soap opera after soap opera. Or they may get, go back to country music. You know, they've been in a good season just really just worshiping God, worshiping God, and then they go back to the old country music. And they get down in the dumps, and they get depression on you. Anybody been there? Anyways, we're going somewhere. I want to know where you're going. I want to know what's going to keep you going after your destiny. 
We're headed somewhere. Tom and I are headed somewhere. We're going to be like Jesus. Look at this. I'm glowing. I got two different things I want to talk about tonight. One of them's dust and what we do with dust. And the other one's vision. You know, it says that Adam and Eve was what? Shaping in dust. Eve actually came out of Adam's rib, but Adam was shaping in what? The dust of the ground. So when you have dust and I blow it on you, what are you going to do with it? You ever see, you ever see fool's gold? You ever see fool's gold? You get it in the rocks and stuff, it looks just like gold. But it's fool's gold because it just looks like it. It imitates it, but it's not the real substance. So you got dust. Every day you get dust on you. Remember that he told the disciples, and I think it's in Mark 6, he says, when they don't receive you, shake off the dust. When they don't receive you, you shake the dust off. It doesn't say when they rail against you. It just says when they don't receive you. So wait a minute. If, if Jonathan comes to me and I just don't receive him, I don't make a response, but I'm not going there with you, and I turn around and I don't receive you, he says shake the dust off. Why? Because what's on me, my impression about what you're presenting is truth, what you're presenting is revelation. You know, you're, you're telling what you, what you believe God's going to do with you, and I just don't really believe it, or I just have unbelief or doubt, or I just, yeah, I don't know about that. But I don't say anything. I just respond in the spirit realm that way. That has influence on our being. That dust creeps and gets on us, and it starts shaping our DNA just like the Father shaped Adam. Some of y'all don't know if you believe that or not. So go with me to Acts 18. I think this is powerful. I saw this the other day. Acts 18. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit. In Acts 17, Paul is in another city. He's plowing. They're in a house. They're in Jason's house. And the, just it's breaking out. Revelation's breaking out. And they actually come against Jason's house, and they actually beat him up in Jason's house. They come in and seize the house and, and take authority over the house and beat him up because they don't know, they don't like to preach him. So Paul leaves. He's in, in Acts 18 now. So he just had a bad experience. With Jason's deal, I mean, they had a good experience, people were receiving the gospel, but then somebody came. It would be no different than the Sanhedrin's coming against us, Nehemiah building the wall. And so Nehemiah's building the work, and then the Sanhedrin come in and say, what are y'all doing over there? Y'all are crazy. You done lost your mind. Has anybody ever told you that? You know, sometimes they don't have to go that far. Just their facial expressions should say enough. You know what I'm saying? So their face expressions, and, and it gets into us. Has anybody ever had somebody say something to you and somehow you just keep repeating that same saying? Does anybody want to own up to that? Yeah. I mean, my dad said something to me the last two days of his life, gave me a statement, and I mean, I must have rehearsed that thing. I, mean, I watch Ben do it all the time. He'll see a movie, and if he catches one good thing in there, man, he's quoting that thing. It's like he's driving it down, and he wants to remember it. I and mean, what's, what's the last movie you saw you had to quote something? I mean, he quotes it over and over and over because he's getting it down, man. He, he just thinks it's a great deal. Well, we do the same thing when negative happens. A negative experience happens, a negative thing transpires, and somebody says something to us, and we'll rehearse that and beat ourselves over and over and over. I mean, we might as well be up against a punching bag just sitting there, and it's over there hitting us in the head, you know, and we're not getting any training out of it. We're just beating ourselves up. Anybody here with me? You know, so then we get down. I mean, I, I don't know about y'all, but me being prophetic is I can get in a room and, and I get in a room and somebody has depression, that thing gets on me. I mean, I, I can feel what they're going through, uh, feel all the uh, junk. And guess what happens is I got to shake that stuff off or I got to go and lay hands on them and war with them until they get their breakthrough. Amen? Amen? And see, what we're doing is we're not warring through to get the breakthrough. So the thing has room to live in the earth. And what God wants, he wants his ambassadors to do the land, to take the land. I remember one time Keith and I was uh, doing post doing a fence in my backyard, and Keith's back locked up. And, I mean, he crippled home, laid in bed, and he couldn't get out of bed, so I called my father-in-law back there, Tracy, and he comes over and just punches him out. And we do all the posts and get them all set, and I'm like, you know, my brother's over there hurting because of my fence. So I went over there, and I started praying for him. And I had to just get ugly with the situation. So you know what it looks like when you get ugly? You don't say, oh, please, in Jesus' name, come off of him. I mean, you go after that thing like a bulldog. Anybody ever seen a bulldog in a fight with a little Chinese tongue? 
you know. I don't know if I had German or Chinese, but I had something, but I was going after that sucker. <laughs> and he got out of that bed, and he got totally better within about five minutes. And when we get enough boldness to realize our calling and our destiny, sure, it's concrete. God knows what he's doing. And we get a prophetic word, heralds out through the thing. We ought to all grab that thing, yes and amen. And I, like Tracy got one the other day from uh, Annie. I bet you was listen to that thing 15 times. And see, what we need to do is learn how to die on those things. He's a good, good father. He's a good, good daddy. And I am loved by him. And when you're riding around in your truck or, or whatever you ride in, man, I am loved by God. If I'm so loved by him, you know, he says, no good thing will he withhold for them that walketh uprightly. No good thing. How many of y'all chew on that one? He says, if you believe, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So if you believe, if you believe in Jesus, then out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's pretty powerful. So you get Paul, he's in Acts 18, and he, uh, I hate these things that has these little, I like the new phones, you just put your thumbprint on it. Well, it's almost blind in here. I need one of my kids to tell me, how do you uh, tune it down? <laughs> Let's start back at the top. He says, and uh, these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, uh, lately come from uh, Italy, his wife Priscilla. And it says, it goes down that they are basically tent makers, and Paul gets into their house because he's a tent maker too. Then they go to work every day doing tents. So he finds somebody that has a common employment as he does, and he stays in their house, and they go out and do tents all week. And on every Sabbath day, he's going and challenging the Jews concerning the, the gospel. And then it says, uh, let's see here. Hang on, give me a minute. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak. Hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Don't you think it's odd that Paul the apostle, having all the encounters of God, he's getting a word from heaven in the night, a vision. A vision to me is a high level. I mean, how many of y'all get dreams? Most of y'all getting dreams. How many of y'all getting dreams with visions? Some of y'all should be doing that, and they should start coming more and more. The other day, uh, Tom and I went to see this lady, uh, apostle lady, and I had an open vision in her thing, saw a little brown bird uh, just came right into the room with a little blue streak of feather, went right around and planted right behind her shoulder. I thought it was the coolest thing because it was in the natural, eyes open. But he gets a vision from heaven, and God's telling him, look, don't be afraid. No man in this city is going to hurt you. Why did he have to tell him that? Because he just went through the experience. He just had a bad experience in Jason's house. They then stirred the whole thing up, probably got some people hurt over the whole deal. So now he's rehearsing that in his head. Oh, my God, if we go after this thing, what, what's going to happen? And it says, and, and sorry for not finding it, but... Uh, It said that the Spirit had to really press on him to speak boldly again. Yeah, here it is. And when Silas and Timoth Timothy were come to Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean from henceforth, and I will go to the Gentiles. So he's having a little showdown here. Somebody doesn't really like him and doesn't like what he's saying. Have you ever had somebody didn't like what you were saying? I can't tell you how many times I just left and just blew it off like that's their problem. But it didn't shake the dust off. And a lot of times that stuff gets into us, and before long we got the fear of man on us. We got fear of failure on us. We're not real overcomers. We're not bold the next time we step out to really speak or really declare or really just stretch our hands out and to pray for somebody. Well, I mean, God didn't show up last time. How many times have you stretched out to do something and nothing happened, and so now you rehearse that? You're like Ben over there rehearsing the movie, baby. I mean, that nothing happened out of that thing, instead of keep pressing through. The ones that have the greatest ministries right now are the ones that press through. Uh, what's the lady down there in uh, Mozambique? 
Heidi Baker, she said when God told her to go after blind eyes that the first three people she prayed for had her same name, Heidi. And God was trying to get her to really get this thing. And none of them got their eyesight. But she had to press through the thing. So he shakes his raiment. And then it says the word of the Lord comes to him. Now, he didn't shake it when he was at Jason's house that we know in Scripture. But he goes through here now. He has another conflict. And he's probably already rehearsing this bad situation that's just happened. How many times do we do the same thing with relationships, with businesses? And we're scared to reconnect again. I remember one time I had this word for this guy on the job, and I was just so t- uh, torn whether I give it to him. You know what the word was? Go back to a country and western dance hall. And he looked at me, he said, I said, yeah, you need to go back to a country and western dance hall. God says you're going to get another date with a girl that's going to be from God, and you're going to have a great time, and you're going to get married, and you're going to have a great relationship. And he just started crying and went in the other room. So about an hour later, he comes through and comes back in where I'm at. He says, you don't know anything about me. I said, I don't have a clue about you. But one thing I do know is I know how to hear God. And I know that I wrestle with telling you to go to a country dance hall. (laughs) Because me, I don't even listen to country music. You know, it's against my conviction. But God's telling you to go back to a country dance hall. You're going to find the love of your life, and you're going to have a good marriage. So I don't know what happened to you. He said, well, I met my first wife at a dance hall, country dance hall. And we were dancing, and we loved doing the little dances at the country deal, and we got married, and then we got a baby coming. And said when she gave birth to the baby at the hospital, she hands me the girl and walks out on me. He said, I've been keeping my, and she was like 14. He says, I don't want to have anything to do with women. I've never stepped back in a country dance hall my whole life. And now you're going to tell me out of all this pain and agony I went through to go back there? I said, yeah, go back and face your giant. And see, we're scared to go back and face our giants. Some of us, we got so much bad DNA in us because of all the dust, all the stuff from the world, and God's wanting to shake that stuff off. I can't tell you how many of us curse our own lives. You know? So, you know, I grab people and hold their hands in ministry, and literally I can tell whether they're cursing themselves because I got needles all in my hands. I say, Ooh, you curse your own works. And so we sit there and we beat ourselves up over and over and over instead of believing the report of the Lord. So I want to give you another scripture. This is a cool one. Go to Micah chapter 7. I kept hearing Micah last night had a message. Now, I was in Micah 7 for about a month ago. But the last night we were staff meeting in prayer, I kept seeing Micah was coming with a message. Now, scripturally, Gabriel was the one that brings messages. Michael, the archangel, comes to war. But Micah, chapter 7, I kept hearing Micah really wants to speak. Micah has a message. So I've been in this chapter, chapter 7, and it's a, man, this book is rough. Because he's going against the people that are just obstinate against the things of God. But it says here, let's read the last, uh, in that day, People will come to you from Assyria and as far as Egypt, from Egypt as far as the Euphrates River, from the seacoast and the mountains. The earth will become desolate because of what the inhabitants has done. Do you all believe that's going to happen? I believe that's coming. I believe because the lifestyle of Americans, we're headed for a rude awakening. But I also believe there's going to be cities that are going to be refuged, by, protected by the glory of God. I think there's going to be strongholds that are going to be stepped up because the government of God are raised up. I believe that's where you're going to see Isaiah 42. The mountain of the Lord will be revealed. And the mountain of the Lord will be displayed against the government that's of this earth. And both of them will see that the government of this age cannot handle the trials that are coming, the tests that are coming. The famine, the pestilence, uh, the people that are going to be devastated by all bankruptcy and all that. The government of God is going to raise up. The glory of God is going to be all on his people. And we're going to be able to freely testify the peace that we get to walk in in him. And that's coming upon us. God has to distinguish between the two. Anyways, it says here, The earth will become desolate because of what the inhabitants have done. Shepherd your people with the shepherd's rod, the flock that belongs to you, the one that lives alone in a thicket in the midst of the pasture and land. Allow them to graze in Basha and Gilead as they did in the old days. That's a pretty good promise right there. You mean I'm going to get to go graze? I'm going to get to go meditate on things above? I don't know about y'all, but we need to do more meditation. We need to get away from yoga and get into the meditations of the Lord. 
As in the days when you departed from the land of Egypt, I will show you miraculous deeds. We're in an hour where miracles are here. If you get a chance, start praying for miracles. If you get a chance, start laying hands on people. Somebody right in here, I just saw somebody taking a risk laying hands on people at work. So I would lay hands on people. We're supposed to have miraculous days. That means we're supposed to have miraculous things happen on the job. Me and William need a couple of miraculous miracles right now, don't we? A couple of good miracles that God would just bust out and show his glory. Do something we can't be done. I remember the first time Kim and I went to get a, we were trying to buy a trailer house in an acre and a half. And we went to the bank, and I think it was like $42,000. And it was like forty two was like, you might as well said $500,000 to us. You know what I'm saying? We didn't have a dealer's card, didn't have a Sears card. I mean, we, back then you didn't know what a visa was. MasterCard, we didn't, I mean, that didn't even exist in our little day. We've been married 24 years, we're not that old, but it, back then we didn't know those things. So anyways, we went to the bank, went to the next bank, went to the next bank. And I knew God told me three times, he says, I'm preparing my priest to home. Three times he told me within a year. Finally, this guy Steve calls. He said, hey, he said, I, got a, a, I want you to come by my place. So I drove by his place. He says, uh, what do you think? I walked through the trailer house and I said, you know, it's a house, but it's not a home. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you don't have a good marriage. And I'm willing to bet you're fixing to dump everything, liquidate all, get all your money hid so you can go through a divorce. Oh, no, no, I'm not doing that. I said, okay, that's what I think. So anyways, we walked around the whole property, came in and I, I said, you know, I want to buy the whole thing, but I don't have peace about the land, so I'm going to go home and pray. So we went home and prayed, and we're laying in bed talking about it, and this guy comes through my ceiling. He has these big round glasses, bald-headed, gray all around the back, and he's really overweight. And he says to me, if you buy that, I'll kill you. And I mean, it hit us like, you know, stinging words. So... I said, you know, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. So I'm buying that property because you're threatening me. You're trying to talk me out of something that God already wants me to have. So then we started going to all the banks, and all the banks kept saying, no, no, we can't do a trailer house with the lamb. We can't do both of them, blah, blah, blah. So I called him. I said, Steve, I said, uh, I met a guy last night. He said, you did? I said, yeah, I don't think you got legal rights over your, your title. He said, uh, who'd you meet? I said, and I described the guy to him. I said, uh, he came to me threatening me. He said, he did? I said, well, no, not like you would think, but to me he did just as well as natural. But then I had a dream that he went out and threw your wife down on the property and got mad at y'all. He said, yeah, he did that yesterday. The same guy that came in my room was the same guy that had the title to the land. He paid all of it, but the guy spent it all on drinking, so he didn't have a clear title because he had back taxes. He said, I didn't want to scare you about it. I'm fixing all of it, but it's going to take about a month. I said, that's fine. We're buying the property. I said, but I think you need some help with marriage counseling. Anyways, they divorced. That was soon to come, about six months after they sold everything. So Cam and I go to all the banks. Now, we knew God wanted us to have it, but we knew the enemy didn't want us to touch it. So we were getting closed doors, closed doors, but Jesus is called the door. The door. The master key. So finally, one night, it's like at 9 o'clock at night, I remember, I think his name was Brett, the president of Bullard Bank calls us, says, Todd, this is the president of blah, blah, blah bank. I said, yeah, what you got? He said, well, I want to do your deal. He said, I think you're all going to pay it off, and I'm going to go ahead and put my name in it, and we're going to do this thing for you. I mean, 42 or whatever, 50000 whatever it was, was a lot of money to us. You know what I'm saying? Anybody in here ever buy a new car, and you kind of choke him when you're seeing the note? But something told you to go after that giant, to go after that deal. You know what I'm saying? So anyways, the whole time I'm talking, man, I feel the knives up here. Some of y'all got so much fear to chance again, whether it has to do with relationships. And I think there's a lot of that in the room. You're scared to have another relationship. You're scared if we do this thing, it's just going to be another big flat failure. And Gus says, no, it won't. Take a risk. Now, William and I are doing risk. We got our altars. Things are on our altar, and it's going to have to be God to pull things off. You know what I mean? Hello. Anybody in here outside of Todd McGee? Boy, y'all are stiff tonight. Loosen up a little bit. You all right? Loosen up a little bit. 
We're in the closing prayer. See that title? It says closing prayer. It's actually a wake-up call for warfare. So anyways, we're going to have the miracles. It says, as in the days when you departed, okay, we already read that part, nations will see this and be disappointed by all their strength. They'll put their hands over their mouths and act as if they're deaf. Now, how would you like it if you woke up tomorrow and everybody that really hates you, everybody that can't stand you, puts their hands over their mouths? And they act like they can't even hear. (laughs) The next verse says this, They will lick the dust like a snake. Like serpents crawling on the ground, they will come trembling from their strongholds to the Lord our God, and they will be terrified of you. Why are they terrified of you? Because now you know who you are in Christ. Now you believe the report of the Lord. Now you've been eaten and grazing in Bashan and Gilead. You went to the right places because you had real shepherds that had a real rod that disciplined you and brought order in your life and shepherded you and, and got you into the right pasture so you ate the right food that brought forth the miracles in your life that you're supposed to have because now you believe in the report of the Lord. See, now you're getting a transformation coming. Now you know what to do with the dust because you're not going to have their DNA. You're having your father's DNA. And the only report you're listening to is heaven. So now your ears are just shut off from all the world and all you want to do is hear the report of the Lord. God, what are you saying? Now you're Paul. You went from Jason's house. Now you're in Corinth and you're trying to proclaim the mysteries because the Spirit of God pressed on you to preach again. The Spirit of God was consuming you to preach it again. Say it again one more time, Tracy. Say it again one more time, Mark. Go for it, Ben. What are you stopping for? Don't stop. Keep going until you get a breakthrough. You see revival break out in the midst of the people. Because I've given you a rod. I've given you my staff. I've given you my scepter. And then your whole thing is serpents. Now you're changing, and you're making them eat from their own dust. Yeah. And now they're terrified because the living God is now making them eat the very things they sow to you. Right. They get to eat. Oh. It's their sub- substance. It's their supper. They want to be in disbelief? Do it. Yeah. But it's time the children of God arise and take their place in the kingdom of God. Yeah. You know, I, I sit there, I watched you. I told Tom and your dad the other day two weeks ago, I saw some bad DNA trying to get around you. And that's what it does. Why is it after you? Because the call of God's on you. And it hates what you're going to become. You know, this uh, lady in the back with the little sling. I saw the Lord tonight give you little screw-down ties like you screw down trailer houses. You know, they got the little ties that have the little triangle thing on the end, and they got all the little spin. And you go and screw them down, and you tie the trailer house off. Why do you do that? Because the winds are coming, and you don't want the thing tumbling. The thing about a trailer house is it's always able to be mobile. It's always able to go to the next place. And so I saw this word all around you, chasing you. Started with a C. And it's chasing you. And it wanted to impregnate you with being consistent, being steadfast, consecrated to your God, that you wouldn't give up. And I literally saw you like a man outside in the weather, and you were just cranking them down, cranking them down. Preparing people for the storm. Last on men to say, no, we're going to hold our ground. We're not going anymore. We're not going from this place to the next place to the next place. No, we're staying this course right now till we get some kind of promise, some kind of answer, some kind of substance, something we can hang on to that's worth living for. So I saw you being concrete in the things that God's going to make you a concrete person that you're stable in what you're going through, and you're going to teach people how to stay the course till they get victory. They're not going to give up anymore and just run off. Does that make sense? I'm not saying you have. I'm saying God is putting that in your DNA that you would teach people how to stay the course, teach people how to stand the ground. Because I think you live in this neighborhood, don't you? So I saw, I saw trailer houses, people that are just mobile going and they can't stay consistent in their daily affairs. And God's going to put inside you a, a tenacity that holds the line, that teaches them how to stay the course, not give up. No, this is our ground. What are we running for? Does that make sense? So anyways, there's a real warrior thing in you that God's going to waken up out of your DNA to rise up that's going to bud out, and it's going to be all around your house. And I saw you affecting a lot of children. And uh, So anyways, I would even say that God's going to teach you how to counsel people that want to give up on marriage. Okay, so that's in there. See, there's a confirming words. And so you need to grab a hold to it because the devil hates people like you. He's scared of people that have consistency. That's the word I saw all around you, consistency, all around you. It's actually going clockwise, but I kept seeing it worse than going clockwise. And then I saw it rear back and just hit you in the chest. 
very back and hit you in the rib. Like it's branding you, like you brand a cow. They put their little logo on the hip. Well, this is going to put a logo on your chest of consistency. Stay in the course, not giving up. Kind of like Braveheart when he said, hold! And the enemy is right there on him. He said, hold! You know, because they could have been ran over any moment. Okay, the other thing I wanted to go after. So we're going to take the dust. We're going to learn to shake the dust off. The things that we got from our past, we're going to shake off. Things that people, even our parents may have said over us, we got to learn to shake off. You know, shake, rattle, and roll, baby. Anybody feel like they got some stuff to shake off tonight? Are y'all alive? Two hands went up out of all that. Huh? Huh? Oh, you, you did that? Yeah. How many of y'all believe that you just have failure after failure in your life? That you've been eating on that? Anybody want to raise your hand? Okay, we got one, two, three. So that's, that's the dust that, that clouded you. You know, in dust storms, sometimes you can't even see. I remember we went to Arizona one time, went with Bobby, and they had dust clouds that's going across, and you could, you'd have to stop the car. You couldn't see because there's so much dust going across the land. And so there's a line, line spirits that came and spoke things over you, and you got to denounce those things. I would denounce the very thing that was spoken. I, I can remember, I mean, it's just that thing my dad said, man, was so weighty. You know, because you want blessings, but the enemy always is there to twist it. Now, I got one more thing I want to talk about tonight. Holding your vision. You got Jacob, and Jacob gets a promise from heaven. It's in, I think, Genesis 28. Uh, he gets a promise. He's actually in a place. He lays down. He gets a little stone, makes a pillow out of the stone, and he has an open heaven where he sees angels descending and ascending, and the Lord standing at the throne room. And the Lord begins to prophesy to Jacob. and says, Jacob, I'm going to cause you to inherit from the north to the south, the east and the west, all the dust of the ground, all your kids are going to inherit. And he tells him all this stuff that he's going to give him. And he says, I'm not going to leave you until I totally accomplish this work. I will be there with you. No matter where you travel, where you go, I will be right there with you because I'm going to make sure this word gets accomplished in your life. And Jacob makes this statement. He says, God, if you'll really do that and I come back to this place and all these things is done, then I'll know you are my God and then I will tithe. So he doesn't make a commitment that I'm going to tithe going into it. He says, no, if you do all this accomplishments, then I know that you are my God, and then I will tithe to you. So he sets out. And the first thing that happens, he goes to work for this guy, and he sees this beautiful girl that he really wants to marry, and the guy makes a deal with him and says, look, you know, you worked for me seven years, and I'll give you her. Anybody know the story? Yeah. He works seven long years and gets the wrong girl. I don't know about you, but I would have had some lights on Gets the wrong thing. He's tricked. But one thing about Jacob, that's what he is. He's always known to trick people. He tricked his brother, didn't he, out of his birthright. He's over there creating that good stew. Had the whole house probably smelled up. And it probably didn't smell like that stuff we ate tonight. We, can we cook some kind of new recipe? And, oh, bless our hearts. <laughs> Last week, we're trying new stuff. We're, we're in a new season, so we're trying new adventures. So last week, we had one, and Kristen came and I sat down to eat. I couldn't stop laughing. I thought we were all going to hit the floor rolling on the floor laughing. It was so, it was so gross. <laughs> it was so bad. But, but I couldn't help myself but just sit there and laugh and laugh and laugh. And literally, we were crying. We were laughing so hard. <laughs> so tonight, we have one. I think the, the boys opted out and ate cereal or something like that. <laughs> I, I was trying to scrape all the stuff off. You know, it was supposed to be this nice, good smell and season, and it didn't even smell good. I mean, Krista had a clothespin on her nose and was trying to eat. It was terrible. <laughs> we're trying. But we're in a new season, so we're trying to eat different stuff. Every one of y'all should be in a new season right now. We're going up the hill of the Lord. We're going to accomplish something. Jacob knew he was going after something. Now, God already spoke to him, but he spoke to his father, Abraham, and Abraham went after it and actually entered into the promise. Isaac went after it and entered into the promise. Now it's Jacob's turn to enter into the promise. It's no different than us. we got to get into the land of Gilead and Bashan and eat the produce that God wants to give us so we can enter into our promise. 
Somebody's going to lay hold of miracles. Somebody's going to walk into a brighter future. Somebody's going to walk into knowing how to walk in the peace of God and the joy of the Lord all the day long. And it has to be this generation. So here he is. He goes seven years laboring for the wrong girl. So he gets tricked into going seven more years. At the whole time, God says, I am with you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to be right there with you. Now, how many times do we really feel God's really checked out? Anybody want to own up to that? Hello, raise your hand so everybody else can know if there's other people in the boat. Because you're wondering, you know, God, did you check out? You forgot? I mean, evidently, you're, you're, you know, I'm not loved by you. Anybody ever say that report? I, I don't feel loved by God. And the whole time she's doing worship. He's a good, good God. He's a good, good daddy. And I'm loved by you. Man, we need to eat that thing. We need to let osmosis take over and let that soak into our skin, down into our bones, because it's not in our bones. When it gets down in our bones, then we're going to be like Samson. We're going to stand up in front of anybody and know that God's fixing to show out. Yeah. If I asked you to come up, would you know that God would be standing with you? Do you know that God's really with you to support you? Mm-hmm. Now, he, he says in the Word, came his favorite scripture, is the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for somebody whose hearts turned towards him that he could strongly support them. Mm-hmm. It didn't even say their heart had to be totally surrendered. Just said their hearts turned towards him, fixed on him. Yeah. Here Jacob is, I, I ain't going to commit to this tithing thing, but when I return, then I know you're, you're my God. So he's making a statement up front, I'm not sure you're the one. You're really the God for me. I mean, you were for daddy and you were for my grandpa, but, I mean, are you really going to do it for me? You know, I mean, I can see how you could love that person, but, I mean, have you been in my house lately? You know, maybe you don't know my upbringing. You know what I'm saying? Did we not rehearse this stuff? See all the sawdust we got to get off of us? And we need to get in the Holy Ghost shower and just stand in the shower and let our Father rinse us and start eating on the report of the Lord. So he goes another seven years, he gets the right one. But he realizes, man, I really don't have any substance. Now I got two wives, got some kids, and I ain't got a lot of substance to take care of this mess. I mean, anybody in here is a millionaire yet? Do we have any millionaires in the group? In, in your head? Who is? You are? But do you have liquid cash? <laughs> you don't know about it, do you, Tom? That is a problem. <laughs> I knew I was hanging out with Tom for a reason. <laughs> so he goes, and, and his father-in-law says, you know what? Why don't you stay another seven years? And I'll make a deal financially for you. And so his father-in-law sits there and says, you know what? If I give him all the ring-tailed and spotted, that's the least of what I have. And they're not the greatest. They don't really have the strength and stamina and all that. So I'm going to give him that, the junk, and I'm going to take the good. And he's so stupid, he's going to fall for it. The only problem was Jacob started believing in the report of the Lord. And he says, yeah, I'll take that deal. And then the final law takes him another twist. He takes all the good, the, the speckled stuff, and puts them way over here and puts guys to tend them and takes all the good ones and he keeps them in all the good pastures. So you know what Jacob does? He somehow got revelation from heaven and says, you know what? I'm going to take the bark and I'm going to cut it out and I'm going to make some rings on it. And I'm going to put it at all their water troughs where all the strong ones are. All the strong bulls and cattle and the goats and all the sheep and everything. Now here, the father-in-law, what a father-in-law. I'm going to take all the healthy ones and put them over here and feed them the best. I'm going to put his old lame stuff over here and I'm going to put some guys to tend it. But they're not going to get the cream of the crop. See, it doesn't matter what the world does. I like this. I like this. Abraham, he's off on his journey, and Lot is with him. And the word of the Lord to Abraham was, leave all your kinfolk, and I'm going to take you into a place where you can inherit all this blessing. So what does he do? He leaves, but he takes his nephew with him. I don't know what y'all know about all, but all is all. (laughs) So he goes on the journey, and God's not really speaking to him. So finally, they come to a crossroads where there's strife and division. You know, some of us should be having some strife and division inside of us. 
Because we're at the threshold right now saying, you know what? I think say no to you and yes to this thing with God. Because there's some things that we're crossing over into another dimension with God that we've got to lay some stuff beside and lay it behind us so we can cross on in and eat the land, the plenty. So if you have turmoil right now, I would say that's what most of the turmoil is about. Anybody there? Don't raise your hand. But when Lot says to him, you know, or Abraham says to Lot, hey, you know, our, our, all of my guys and your guys are fighting with each other. We're fighting over the water. You know, we need to find out which way do you want to go, and I'll take the other way. So Abraham's already wrestled. It don't matter what Lot you give me. I'm walking in blessing. Let that sink in a minute. Abraham tells Lot, which way you want to go, and I'll go the opposite. You tell me what you want, and I'll give it to you, and I'll go somewhere else. So Lot chose Sodom and Gomorrah and went that way, and Abraham went the other way. Immediately, the Lord speaks to Abraham and tells him all the stuff he's about to walk into when he cut ties with his family. Isn't that interesting? So I was working for Color Tile. And color tile at the time, we had them at the peak. We were making like four fifty a yard on carpet when everybody else was making two seventy five and three dollars. This is back in the early eighties. And I mean we made the best money on everything. And I had a two year deal with Kurt, the manager, to do all their floors. So my older brother talks me out of the contract. He said, You know, they're stealing from people up here. I said, What are you talking about? Well, you know that silver come term devil, uh, he's in there, Carol. He'll sell them a goof proof kit, cost you $125, and he doesn't give it to them. I said, yeah, but that's his bad, not mine. I just work for the place. All I'm doing is installing the stuff. So anyways, he kept talking and talking and talking. Finally, I said, you know, you're right. We're going to quit and go find somewhere else to work. So I went in and told him I was quitting, and I went out the next day to find work, and the next day Richie quit me and went and got all my account up there color tile. And I said, Lord, what in the world is that? He said, Abraham and Lot. I'm trying to bring you in the blessing. You can't be walking in blessing with that mess. Isn't that interesting? So guess what happens? I go and start all back over. Now I'm back down to $3 a yard. Now I'm down to doing little bedrooms instead of whole houses. And I'm barely getting by for Canada. I think we were making like three fifty to five fifty a week. Instead, we were making twelve to fifteen hundred. Now we're back down to three fifty to five fifty a week. And six months later, I, I get a big job from Rex. And I'm going to, to uh, Henderson, I think, and my truck catches on fire. Oh. Yeah. I borrowed $2,500 and put a motor in it, and the motor was knocking. The guy told me to sue him, so I drove probably 10 months with it, just clack, 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 you know. And it was just a cluttering down the road. So I got down, I had a whole roll of carpet in my Bronco, and the truck catches on fire. I pop the hood, and the police pulls over and puts it out. I'm like, no, no, let it burn down. I'll get insurance on this thing. <laughs> But it does just enough damage to melt the carburetor and all the wiring harness. Well, the motor was already shot. And I just borrowed $2,700 10 months ago, and we hadn't even paid that off yet. So he takes me to the store. I use the pay phone, call Rex. I said, man, I thank you for a good job today, but I can't do it. My truck just caught on fire. He said, do what? I said, yeah. I said, I knew it was on its last leg, but I don't have any money to get another one. So he, he uh, comes down there in his truck, backs up to it, put the carpet and everything in his. He said, you know what, Todd, I really like you. I've been with him about six months doing little piddly jobs. My brother's over there at the other store making big money, and I'm over here scraping by. And so I go to Henderson, start the job, and Rick shows up at lunchtime. He says, you know, I've been thinking about it. You just take my truck for two weeks, and I'm going to give you all the best jobs I have so you can make some money and pay all this mess off. I said, good. And I'm thinking best jobs, I'll make maybe $1,000 a week. Oh, no. He gave me the cream of the crop jobs. I was making like 2000 2500 a week for two, three weeks we did that. And I gave his truck back. I, I remember changing the motor out in my aunt's garage. Took that whole sucker out of there and put the thing in there. And uh, then Rex saw that what, what I could do the bigger jobs, and I was doing great. He said, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and move you on up. You can have all the good stuff. Gave me divine favor. The next month, after I got my divine favor, the next month, color tile bankrupt. My brother's calling. Hey, man, I need a job. I said, really? You need a God because you need to go get with him and find out how he's going to get you through your mess. Because, see, what God wants to do is take people like Blake 
and cause him to go through something that Blake knows his God. And he can stand up here and say, me and my God's been talking. And this is what he has for me. And this is what I can bring to the table. Because it's not far from that that the, the children will lead us. It's not far from that people like Ben and Garrett that are pressing through knowing they got a call in their life and they're pursuing a living God and God's going to start showing up with really visions and dreams and stuff and start speaking. I mean, Ben had a dream the other night about our group, you know. But we got to get with our God, so we're going to get the, the bad DNA off of us, the bad dust. You're in a season of real breakout. A real breakout's about to hit you. Your whole painting thing's going to change. I saw all kind of bright colors, and I saw the rainbow over you. So God's really going to start speaking to you about the covenant that he's gotten in with you. He's cut a covenant with you, each and every one of us. The sad thing is most of us don't know what the covenant really means. You know what I'm saying? Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water if what? If you believe. So where's that at? I think it's in John 6. So, like, Lori, do you expect favor in this season? Do you expect an upgrade in this season? Do you even believe that God wants to give you an upgrade this season? Is that in the makings? So I would go pray about that because I saw upgrade. But if you believe the report of the Lord and mix it with faith, you get the upgrade. I remember calling Stacy, came his sister out on a Wednesday night, and I said, God's going to give you a dollar raise. And it was on Wednesday night, Sunday morning, she came. She said, I got a dollar raise this week. I said, yeah, I saw them. They gave it with a stingy hand, and God's going to slap it and give you another dollar this next week. <laughs> the next week, she got another dollar. She went from $10 to $12. And it was like a week after that, God says, you need to quit your job and open your own business. Remember that? And she did. And they struggled when they first got in their business. But it was the future of, you know, now she's doing great. But the first season, I remember they did them little goofy stuff they bought and sold. Remember that? And we kept begging her, you need to get in the flower thing. But they, they knew they were on their way. Yeah, they did little antique finds or whatever, stuff I'd probably leave in a garage sale. I don't know what your day looks like today. But your head is somewhere. Jacob wrestled with it and kept laying hold of it. So what he does is he takes the rings, puts them in all the water troughs where all the strong bulls and calves and sheep were. And then they would come to eat that, and then when they beheld the rings on it, they started giving birth to ring and spotted children. And so then his whole thing, so now he has his little herd over here that's reproducing after his kind. Now Laman's whole herd is now reproducing his kind too. So he can't help. He's just getting prospered everywhere. And Layman's report is, you know, ever since you came, I, I, my, everything around me has been prospering, flourishing. But see, he didn't ever intend on us to serve somebody else the rest of our life. He wants us to be actually running stuff. Anybody, how many of y'all believe you're supposed to have your own business? Oh, wait a minute. One, two, three. You already have your own business? You already have your own business? How many of y'all already have your own business? Okay, who doesn't have your own business, but you believe you're going to have your own business? Now, let's mark this down. One, two, three, four. Yeah, these two giants here. Five. Ben. Ben already said he had his own business. I don't know what he does. <laughs> so, let's see. All the kids are raising their hands. Anybody over here that, okay, you're raising your hand? Good. Amen. So I need a fishing business, and I'm going at it. Good. So, Father, you just heard that. We, we agree with that assignment in Jesus' name. We agree with that. Mm. Some of y'all are in a real lull, and God wants to get you through your lull. Anybody, can I pray with anybody that's in a lull? A lull is in a valley in a hard place, in a flat place, you're just flat. You got something first time? Yeah. Because I want to pray for a couple people. Uh, yeah, I got a couple of words for you. Uh, Garrett. Uh, I don't need a mic. We don't need it. I'll have a word in mind. Um, I, I was just sitting back there, and, and I just saw raw faith on you, just a raw gift of faith. And, um, and I feel like... Um, I don't know. I just feel like there's reckless, like a recklessness on you, just a reckless faith. 
that uh, that that you're not scared of what people think about you. And um, there's just something inside of you. It says, blessed are those who thirst and hunger, for they shall be filled. And I, there's such a tenaciousness and a hunger inside of you that will not be denied, um, that, that you're just going after the Lord hardcore. Um, and it's just raw, raw, raw faith. Uh, and really, I mean, it is such a pull on, on the Lord and such a pull on heaven um, that, that, that you actually pull in. And, um, and even, e- even the ability to pull in faith for other people. And so you need to, well, I don't know what you do or, or, or whatnot, but uh, the influence you have, start, start asking the Lord how to, how to, how to impart that. And, and what I mean by that is how to, how to, how to be a broker of it, because you can broker your faith. And, and you know, I, I just see, like, you going out and doing, like, radical, like, evangelism, like, taking people out and just, you know, just going and, and, and doing things with um, just are out of the box. I mean, don't even, you know, you don't even have to put a, a substance or a structure to it, but because God's really, God's really, he's, you know, says so, so signs and wonders follow those that believe, and signs and wonders are going to follow your life, and, um, you know, you're actually going to shake a lot of complacent people up and out of, out of what their, their status quo is, so uh, it's just all over you, and what's your name? No, 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 you. Yes. Heather. Heather. Um, here's what I got for you. I was sitting back there, and I was, I was looking at you, and let me open this up. This is why the the hand, the thing that goes around my ear is better, but uh, it says this, it says in Joel chapter 2, verse 25, it says, um, it says, so I will restore to you the years that the the swarming locust has eaten, and the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, Um, and it goes in verse 26, it says, you shall eat, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously um, with you. I, I, I just, I get the sense that, um, that there's just been a lot of like, uh, like hope deferred in your life, and uh, you know it says hope deferred makes the heart sick, and uh, and and specifically in relationships, and uh, and I just see like the Lord like, um, is 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 going to break in in you and really like close the distance on some relationships and and restore some things um, that that you feel like you've lost, uh, specifically your youth, and um, and some dreams that that you that you actually had and you. You feel like you can't you can't accomplish those dreams and stuff. It's it's really a season for you of God breathing on those dreams and breathing on uh, on you, um, just because there's 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 the real gift and there's a real call in your life, and 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 there's like when I see when I look at you I see a razor blade, and and you can cut people. I mean you you are you just you have you have an ability right with your words, but but I think the Lord would want you to know that it's a gift. Right. And it's like he was talking about blessing and cursing Deuteronomy 28. Listen, I can bless anyone in this room and I can curse anyone in this room. And each of them have a will have a response. But you have a gift really that that actually to move things and to bless people and to decree things over people um, because that's the Lord's anointed you to do that. And so the gifts and callings are irrevocable. So you can use it for good or you can use it for bad. But the Lord's turning your heart in some areas um, and he's actually drawing your heart. You're going to be a worshiper. Um, and worship's really going to come on you. It's going to move you, and you're actually going to give people cutting words, like by the Spirit of the Lord. And, and really, and when I was looking at your eyes, like your eyes, uh, like you're a real discerner. So you can come into a room and you can discern the thoughts of people. You know, like where they're. You, you may not know what they're thinking, but you know where they're at. You don't know how you know, but you just. It's it's a gift of discernment, and it's a prophetic. It's a it's a revelatory gift that the Lord's given you. Mm-hmm. And as as you get set free, and as the Lord just begins to turn your heart, and He begins to do this work in your life. That thing's going to come alive, and you're going to be able to feel people's burdens. You're going to be able to see where they're at. You're going to be able to give them a word that's going to be like Book of Acts. It says mm-hmm. they were given a word, and they were cut to their heart. Mm-hmm. And you're actually going to be able to unlock people's hearts. Where the enemy's tried to come in and lock your heart up, it's being unlocked right now, and actually he's going to open you up where you're going to actually have a ministry of opening up people's hearts and turning people's hearts. Um, and, you know, it's good. Yeah. It's a good ministry to have, and it's, it's, it's on you, so I bless you with that. And that's, um, anyways, that's all, yeah, that's all I got. Good. I want to pray for some people. Anybody need prayer? In a low place, that's the people I want to pray for. Okay? Yes. Tom, come help me. You're not done yet. I I want to pray for the ones that's been really just chewing yourself out. The ones that are in the low place first that are chewing yourself out. You're just 
than just ragging on yourself. Does that make sense? Dogging yourself. Have you been doing that? Yeah? Come up here. I want to pray for you. I felt the whole night while I was coming up against all kind of walls, man. I was like, woo, boy, this dust is something else. Anybody get real revelation about shaking dust off? You know, if you're just feeling like somebody just slimed you with their thoughts, <laughs> shake that stuff off. Does that make sense? Yeah. Huh? Your own thoughts? Your own thoughts? Yeah. 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 I saw the Lord going to remove the word tolling off of you. What was Tolling, sweating, just striving. I saw your hands real laboring and striving, trying to figure out how to make things work. And God's going to bring you into a place of real rest and trust that you'll be able to learn how to walk in peace, you know. You know it says if the, if the house receives you, leave your peace with them. But if they don't, it says shake the dust off. You know that? Shake the dust off. If you're feeling rejection from a body, go find the people that love you, you know. Amen? God's really going to mess around with you. Yeah. I see him really just playing games with you. Acting real goofy with you. That's my daughter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Goofy mm-hmm. games. This is your daughter? Oh, wow. Yeah. I saw him like the Three Stooges when they poked him in the eye. <laughs> you know? So, there's something about that. He's going to get many, many Yeah. Yeah, he's going to teach you just how to, I know you're going to tell me I'm already there, but he's going to teach you how to loosen up. You just say, God, this year is. That's why you're going to say it's yours. You know, I saw him removing stuff off your shoulders that doesn't need to be there. He says his yoke's easy and your burden's light. And so your burden needs to become light. And when it becomes light is when you really give up and say, God, it's yours. I really put my confidence back in you. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, if she followed the same thing you got, if this is your daughter, the tolling, that's your niece? Do what? My sister passed when she was three. Okay, so she's been your daughter. So, y'all got a tremendous call on your household. Yes, you do. You know, you're going to save the brokenhearted. You're going to go find the people that nobody else want to love. And uh, it's all over your whole household. You got a ministry. And so, I saw real refining coming to your house, a real purity coming to your house. God wants to bring honor to your house. I saw the Lord get rid of a clothesline in the backyard. And so God shows me pictures. That's so how I show them. Clothesline to me is the old days we used to hang our clothes out to dry. But a lot of times when you're hanging clothes out, it means you're showing everybody else's clothes. So there's a real spirit of honor wants to come to your house that you'd honor one another and cover each other's backside and not expose each other on their weaknesses. So, the, so I saw the Lord getting rid of the clothesline in the backyard. So you learn how to honor one another and cover one another's nakedness, covering their weak points, and just go to God in prayer. It doesn't mean you go, oh, we need to pray for so-and-so there. No, you just go to the Lord in prayer. Now, if you tune into it discerning-wise by the prophetic, which is what he's saying on her, that's right. God gave it to her because now she's a real friend. Yeah. So you go from being a servant to a son to a friend. Until you can learn to serve well, you can't be a son. And when you're a son and you're trustworthy, he makes you a friend. And then his friends, he reveals secrets to them. So the friends get to know all kind of stuff that goes on in your life, but they'll honor you and they'll never bring shame to you. See what I'm saying? And that's what God's trying to do is restore real purity in the prophetic. See what I'm saying? So anyways, I want to bless you. Okay. What's your name again? Shelly. Shelly. Father, I thank you for Shelly. Lord, I just thank you for your blessings, Lord God, will overtake this house. Yes, Father. Even the uh, concerns with her husband, Lord, I just ask you to just overshadow him with the grace of God. Lord, let your favor come to their house, Lord Jesus, to really trust in you. So let your uh, revelation flow, Lord God. Let dreams come and the reality of walking with you be more sure. I pray 
that you'd open up just the revelatorial rim of their house to just get golden nuggets from the Father. Yes, Father. Lord, your word would come alive. Yes. That the songs would come out of the house. Yes, Jesus. Mm. Father, I just ask you to just bathe them in the song of the Lord. Let them have new songs come up out of their loins, Lord. New songs. Let out of her belly flow rivers of living water. God, blessings and not cursings. Blessings, Lord God. Let blessings come morning, noon, and night. household wrestle with fear? I do. <laughs> and my son pretty much starts. Yeah, so I just, I saw your God arise and, and your enemies being scattered and I saw fear raise up like, what? <laughs> and he had to get out of the house. So Father, we just ask for that our God would arise that the God of peace would come and soon crush Satan underneath our feet. Lord, I pray that you get a hold of this whole household and call them to come into the kingdom of God. And we bid them to come closer into the kingdom of God. We bid to him, come closer. Come closer to the Father's fire. Mm. Yes. Father, I pray that you captivate the Son and the yes. Father, Lord, yes. in Jesus' name. Mm. Mm. I just want to challenge you all to guard your mouth when it comes okay. to him. <laughs> okay. okay? Really, because I felt stuff. And, and he won't be able to enter in because of, you know, we got to learn to bless. Does that make sense? It's really something about that. So if we'll know the weight of our words and what we can do. I saw the Lord try to create a fire and amuse him to come closer. And then I saw your word. And he backed up. Because your word. Yeah, you want him, but it's your word. So God says, guard your mouth. Cherish the things you would speak to him. And cherish the things you would speak over him. The report is, no, my husband's on fire for God. No, my husband's coming into the kingdom. See what I'm saying? You declare the word of the Lord. What does God say about it? Okay? Oh, I feel that for your house. God's going to bring your whole household into the kingdom of God if you let him. You know that? Whole household. Yeah. But that's the load. You've been trying to do it. Not you. It's, it's you, God. I'm not doing this thing. You do it, and then we can boast that it's you. Yeah. If I do it, then I can boast that I've done it. That's not me. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm just removing that from you. All the work of trying to do this thing. See what I'm saying? And you're going to find that you're really loved. When we tear all the facade aside, you're going to find that you're really loved. Yeah, here. We're here. Here I don't. Yeah, you don't. And you can find there's a real family waiting for you. That you can really say, I'm, I'm really in this thing. They're not going to hurt me. See what I'm saying? And then you're going to be out there helping secure the people don't know how to secure their own selves. I mean, you got, I see missions all over your household once God gets you on the line. I'm telling y'all. Paula, can you come pray for her shoulder? If God releases you too, would you do that? This is a friend of ours. Sure. 